We're here with an end times review, and my name is Jamie Northrup. I'm a member of Believers in Grace Fellowship Church, and I'm here with uh, Brother Jacob Prosh, um, who uh, is part of Mordial Ministries, the leader. In fact, you started, Jacob. Can you give us a, a, a little history of Mordial Ministries? We began in 1994. We're based in several countries, Australia, New Zealand, USA, of course, Great Britain, South Africa, Japan, Philippines, Thailand, and so forth. Visit our website, moriel.org. You can read all about us, M-O-R-I-E-L dot org. We'd love to hear from you. Brother Jacob will be uh, asking a, number, a series of questions today about eschatology and prophecy and the end times. And um, I noticed uh, we have a number of your books here, The Dilemma of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpazo. Can you give a brief explanation of each of them? Harpazo was the latest book. It's the Greek word for to be snatched away violently. It's the Greek word for rapture. It deals with the timing of the rapture in the sequence of prophetic events. The timing of the rapture in the sequence of prophetic events. It looks at what the scripture actually says. It's not trying to react against pre-trib or post-trib or pre-rap. It's not trying to react against anything. It takes a proactive approach. What does the word of God actually teach about the rapture from a diverse array of facets? Shadows of the Beast, how the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church. Although people have done all sorts of exegetical and pseudo-exegetical acrobatics, asegetically, with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're told directly that the day of the Lord will not come. The episunagage of gathering together to Jesus will not come until the faithful believers know who the Antichrist is. This was the belief of the early church long before the invention of pre-tribulationism, circa 1830. We might call it a kind of a sequence of books. The first was, in this series, was the Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea looks at the seven churches in Revelation. Not only seven churches that existed at that time in history, in what is today Turkey, but takes the position held by many dispensationalists that these seven churches represent seven somewhat overlapping but sequential ages of church history, the last one being the age of the church of Laodicea, what the last church would be like before Jesus comes, and using that as the staging point to address the rest of end time prophecy. So there's three books, Arpenzo, dealing with the rapture, Shadows of the Beast, dealing with the identity of the Antichrist and how his identity will be revealed, and the dilemma of Laodicea. Ideally, if you're so inclined, I suggest you read this one, the dilemma of Laodicea first, Shadows of the Beast second, and Harpazo third, because that is the order in which these events are going to take place. We also have a variety of other books available on our website. The dilemma of Laodicea is simply a uh, the first one of a purely eschatological nature, but there are other books as well. Well, my first question, Jacob, is Jesus said in the Gospels that I will establish my church, I'll build it, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And yet we see in the church today false teachers, false prophets, prophets false prophecies, and, and an ecumenical movement. Can you explain how, how that relates? First of all, when Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he was speaking at what is today called Banyas, Kessidia Felipe. The gates of hell were a cave where melting ice caps from Mount Hermon would filter down into the cave, forming a whirlpool. This is where pan worship had taken place during the Seleucid period, and there would be conjugal sex with these goats who were consecrated to the god Pan by the priests, after which the goats would be tossed into this whirlpool. If the whirlpool sucked them under the earth and they didn't come up again, it meant that their sacrifice was acceptable. If the carcass came back up, it meant it wasn't. It became a metaphor among the Jews for biological death. What Jesus was saying is, because of his resurrection and the message of salvation and resurrection preached by the church, that biological death would not prevail against the eternal kingdom of God. We have to understand Matthew chapter 16, 17, and 18 in that sequence. In fact, we have a teaching dealing with it. Uh, 
again, available from the website or through our newsletter. So it's talking about something quite different than most people make it out to be. The proliferation of false prophets and deceivers is something that Jesus said was certainly going to multiply, increase in intensity and in frequency in the last days. There have always been false prophets, false teachers, deceivers, but in the last days, the proliferation of them becomes extraordinarily intensified to a degree that is historically unprecedented for the church, but is prefigured by what happened in the last days of Judah, in the days of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. New Testament eschatology, the Gospels, take the themes from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, fallen as Babylon, the belief in the invincibility of the temple, that was a false belief, the proliferation of false prophets, the things that happened in the last days of Samaria, circa 721 BC, and the last days of Judah, 585, 586 BC, are recycled in the New Testament to explain what's going to happen. As always, the first key to understanding prophecy is understanding history. Yeah. What happened in the days of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Micah, Joel is a figure of what's going to happen in the last days. Then, of course, it was the rise of the Babylonian Empire. In the last days, it will be Babylon the Great, but it will follow the same pattern. Right. If you want to know what's going to happen to the church, look at what happened to Israel. The first temple and the second temple were destroyed on the exact same day of the Jewish year, to Shabbat of the 9th of August. The, the, in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the, the seven churches where Jesus is addressing um, and there has been speculation by Bible scholars and Bible teachers that those seven churches were around at the time. You know, obviously, were seven churches that were around at the time, and then those seven churches would be representative of the church ages throughout the last two thousand yes. years. Yes. But and the, with the last one in particular being being the one of most concern, can you explain? That? Yes. The Greek names of those churches indicate something about their character and their prophetic. Aura, as it were. Laodicea comes from a, as a compound word from two Greek words, Laodikeomai, people's judgments, or conceivably people's rights, or their rights to make their own judgments. The character of the final church, Laodicea, that is defined by a lukewarmness, a materialism, but also a blindness to its spiritual condition. Laodicea's first problem is it doesn't know it's Laodicea. I saw to anoint your eyes that you may see. The source of its problem is it's no longer running on the word of God. It's running on people's opinions. You look today, the church growth formulas, the purpose-driven agendas, things like this, they're based on marketing psychology. They're not based on biblical principles. It's people's opinion. We live in a consumerist society. The word faith teaching of the money preachers. Name it and claim it. Call in quick with your visa card. You can have this. Well, that just simply becomes transferred into the church. It is a redefinition of Christianity based on Western consumerism. This is the worldview as it's evolved, and it's permeated the church. In other words, instead of the gospel permeating the world, the world is now permeating and perverting the gospel. That is the nature and character of Laodicea. It becomes manifested in spiritual blindness, materialism, lukewarmness, and a lack of preparation for the prophetic events that are impending. Wow. There's a famous picture that shows Jesus standing outside a door, and he's knocking, but there's no handle on the outside to get in. And, and, and I think that's in relation to Revelation uh, 3.20. Uh, but can you explain how... Most of us will take Revelation 3.20 and apply it evangelistically, and it's not wrong we do. In sharing our faith with an unsaved person and witnessing doing evangelism, I stand at the door and knock. We can present the gospel using that as an invitation to accept Christ, a challenge to come to faith, and I have no problem with that. I've done it myself. I still do it myself. But that is not in its exegetical context, primarily what that verse is talking about. Jesus has been locked out of the church. When a church is no longer subordinating its practices to the principles of Scripture, it's running on people's opinions instead of on the Word of God. Jesus is outside. 
If Jesus was inside, we wouldn't have purpose-driven lives. If Jesus was inside, we wouldn't have counterfeit revivals. If Jesus was inside, we wouldn't have lunatics running the asylum. Amazing. So, so would Jesus even be allowed in most churches today? Not the real Jesus of the Bible, the make-believe Jesus. Again, it goes back to the same old ancient dilemma of anthropomorphic God and neomorphic man. People are making Jesus in their own image of likeness, the Jesus that they want him to be, not the one who he really is. Right. So, so when someone like the Pope says that Allah and Yahweh are the same God, it, it's not the same God. It's not the same, you know, same Jesus. First of all, the Jesus of Islam is a prophet inferior to Muhammad, Isa. Believers will not even call him Yisra. Arabic speaking believers will call him Yisra HaMasiyah. Yisra Salaam Majdan, Hallelujah, Yisra HaMasiyah. They will not even refer to him in the same terms of, 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 of Quranic Arabic. However, let's look, look at this further. The archaeological record substantiates that Allah was the name of the Nabataean moon god. It was the name of the Nabataean moon god associated with the Kaaba, with, with, with the stone. Um, you have an etymological problem in Semitic language, not in the languages themselves, but when they're translated into English. The Hebrew word Elohim, or El God, the next word, El God, has its Arabic equivalent in Allah. As a generic term for God, you can say Allah equals Elohim. But as a proper name, Allah does not equal Yahweh. It is a different God. Moses tells us other gods are Shadim, demons. Paul tells us other gods are demonoid, demons. Allah of Islam is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a demon idol. His character is not even the same. The Jesus of Islam is not the same. Muslims like to protest that the Quran says more about Jesus than it does Muhammad. That is actually true. Verse for verse, in the Surahs of the Quran, it speaks more of Jesus than it does Muhammad. Except everything it says about Jesus contradicts the New Testament and is false and was written centuries after the time of Jesus. Not only his proposed inferiority to Muhammad, but that it was Judas who died on the cross, not Christ. That he is not God's son. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. That is called an antichrist doctrine in 1 John. The Jesus of Islam is fundamentally, fundamentally incompatible with the real Jesus of the New Testament. Well, you bring the papacy. Again, it's the same issue. Which Jesus is it? Our Jesus, the real one, was emphatic. If anyone says he has returned physically before the parousia, before his actual return, when every eye will see when he come as he left, if anyone says he's returned physically, do not believe it. In the Roman Catholic Mass, they believe the doctrine of transubstantiation. Jesus comes back in the Blessed Sacrament, the bread and wine, based on Aristotle's philosophy of accidents, debunked by modern chemistry and physics, that becomes the incarnation of Jesus. They kneel down, bow down to it, and pray to it in an act of idolatry. Then Jesus again dies sacramentally, and in a cannibalistic ritual called the Mass they eat him. I'm not trying to offend Catholics, I'm simply telling you this is the catechetical teaching of Roman Catholicism. Now, half of my family is Jewish, half of my family is Catholic. I'm not anti-Semitic, I love Israel. And I'm not anti, uh, I'm certainly not anti-Catholic, I love my mother. But because I love Catholic people, I want them to know the truth. Roman Catholicism is not biblical Christianity. You mentioned the Pope. Jesus again stated directly in Matthew 23, one is your father in heaven. As a religious title, call no man your father. One is your father in heaven. When you begin to say that the Pope is the definite article, the holy father, you are putting a man in the place of God. The Greek term antichrist does not simply or even primarily necessarily mean against Christ. It means in place of Christ. The title of the Pope in Latin, Vicarius Christus, we get the word Vicarius, Vicar of Christ. If you were to translate that from Latin into Greek, it says Antichrist. When a Pope puts on a tiara, every Pope says, I am the Antichrist. Now remember, the Protestant reformers understood this. They were not simply Roman Catholic priests 
for all their faults and mistakes, people like Luther, Calvin, etc., it's really, they were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic Church. They were humanist scholars. They understood what the papacy was. They said it was an antichrist institution. So you have a man now who puts himself in place of Christ, in place of God the Father, but he also says something else, that he is infallible. It is the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. Oh no, it's the magisterium of the church. When the Pope speaks ex cathedra from the chair of Peter, he's infallible. He's infallible. Was he infallible when he protected pedophile priests and nuns at the expense of not protecting the children whose lives they destroyed when they molested them? Oh, only when he speaks infallibly. When was the last time he did that? Munificentissimus Deus, when he proclaimed that Mary had no sin. Now the scriptures say all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. In the Magnificat, Mary herself, the greatest woman who ever lived, her name was of course Amelia, not Mary. Mary said, in response to Gabriel, Gabriel, you're the greatest woman who ever lived. You are going to be the mother of the Messiah. God Almighty is going to be conceived as your son and bring salvation. The first words out of her mouth. The first words out of Mary's mouth. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. If Mary, if Miriam says she needs a savior and the Pope says she doesn't, who do I believe? I believe Mary, not a pedophile protecting apostate in Rome who claims to be infallible. The papacy is a counterfeit of the Father, as a counterfeit of the Son, and it's a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. It suits the Pope. It suits John Paul II that kissed the Koran. It suits him to have taken the RT when he went to India, the Hindu mark. Because those are false religions of Satan, and so is Roman Catholicism. No, I'm not against Catholic people. I love Catholic people, and I want them to know the truth. The Church of Rome is not the Church of Jesus Christ. Jacob, we really appreciate this because a lot of us didn't come out of the Catholic Church where we were saved, you know, as Baptists or as non denominational Christians. And uh, we read the Bible and, and saw that, that these were the words that were If you out. want to know what Roman Catholicism is, do not listen to an ecumenical deceiver or a deceived ecumenical evangelical. Talk to somebody saved out of the Church of Rome. Talk to somebody who was Catholic and was born again. They will tell you what I'm telling you. It is the horror of Babylon and Christian masquerade. It is the pontifical religions of ancient Rome behaving as an imposter, pretending to be biblical Christianity. It is a hybrid of pontifical Roman imperial religion and a form of debauched Christianity. It's Christendom, but it's not Christianity. Did, did, did Jesus, was, when Jesus spoke to the church of Laodicea, was he giving a foreshadow of what these days were going to be like with the emergent church movement, the secret? Well, people's opinions. All of these things are based essentially on people's opinions. Now, I would point out it is not simply Roman Catholicism. Mainstream liberal Protestantism is, if anything, worse than Rome. Yeah. At least before the present Pope, who's caved in on homosexuality, the Roman Catholic Church said it was wrong. Many of its priests and nuns are, of course, homosexuals and lesbians, but at least their official position said it was wrong. At least they said they were against abortion. Liberal Protestantism is even worse than Rome. It is not picking on Catholicism. The World Council of Churches is as much an abomination as the Vatican has ever been, and in some respects, possibly even worse. Much the same can be said for Eastern Orthodoxy. That's like the woman who put the leaven in the three packs of grain. The three main expressions of Christianity are, in fact, Christendom, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy. They are all patristic religions. They are based on the later perversions of the Church Fathers, particularly the post nicene Church Fathers. They are not apostolic, they're patristic. They don't come from the teachings of the New Testament primarily. They come from the distortion of the New Testament by the Church Fathers and then evolved and mutated over a period of centuries to the abomination we have today. 
They came from Babylon, not from Peter, James, and John, and not from Jesus. They came from Babylon, and they're going to Babylon. Babylon the Great. So Jacob, I think this leads us to your second book. Where is the church of Laodicea and the leadership of the church of Laodicea leading us? The Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. And, and would you say, how, how, how do shadows of the beast fit in with Babylon the Great? Babylon the Great will be the platform of the Antichrist. Okay. He will come and convince the nations and do so doing not only a political agenda, but a combined economic, political, and religious agenda that he's the savior. He wants to put, ultimately, Antichrist in place of Christ. And Christendom is going to be part of his platform to do it. Let's look at the papacy. The pontiff, the title, was the, was the religious title of the Imperial Empress of Ancient Rome. It meant bridge builder between the faiths. You had religio lucita and religio illicita in ancient Rome. They didn't care what religion you had, as long as you acknowledged the pontiff as the bridge builder between them. There was only one religion they hated. They hated biblical Christianity. They later turned on the Jews in 70 AD, and again with Bar Kokhba's rebellion under Hadrian in 120 AD. Then they turned on the Jews. But everybody else had a license. They were religio lucita, except for believers. Well, let's look at just Pope John Paul II. Once in, in, in La Paz, Bolivia, once in Santo Domingo, once in Mexico, and once in the United States. He called the evangelical Christians in Latin America turning to Pentecostalism, ravenous wolves, four times. Yet, he embraced the Dalai Lama, yeah. a man who says there's no creator, but lets himself be worshipped as a reincarnation of the Buddha. He kisses the Koran, he takes the Atsi in, in, in India. He had a convocation with religious leaders in Assisi, Italy. He had witch doctors, he had some Mormons, he had Zoroastrians, he had everybody and anybody but born again Christians on a patient's walls. This is what John Paul II was and did. He was the pedophile protecting instrument of Satan, and his successors are no better. If possible, the elect will be deceived, or the elect are being deceived. So, so even as we speak, this false church is rising up. Absolutely. When you look, J.I. Packer, the reformed Calvinist theologian, the late Chuck Colson, among others, endorsed Peter Creed's book, Ecumenical Jihad. We have to have ecumenical union, not with Rome, but with Islam to morally redeem society. This was J.I. Packer. This was Chuck Colson. This is betrayal. This is the spirit of Judas. And, and this church will ultimately promote someone called the Antichrist. Well, it will promote an interfaith unity with a political agenda tied to economic interests that will be the platform for the Antichrist ascending power. The false prophet will head the religious system and he will give power to the other beast. This is what's going to happen. Central to this is not only the Middle East, but also Europe. There's no doubt in my mind that what we see transpiring in Europe is at least the embryo of what the prophet Daniel predicted would happen. Those countries coming back together in some kind of a confederation that had been in the Roman Empire. As I've been pointing out for many years, if you take somebody in Ireland, a Celtic country, somebody in Poland, a Slavic country, somebody in Austria, a Germanic country, and somebody in Portugal, a Latin country, what is the only thing they have in common? Cuisine? No. Language? No. History? No. Culture? No. The only thing an Irishman, a Polish person, a Portuguese person, person, and an Austrian has in common is no more patre con filio con spirito santo. It becomes a religious cohesive. It becomes a glue to engender an artificial unity in, in, in Europe with a political aim. They want to reverse the Reformation because of the political interest in doing so. So, so in your book, Shadows of the Beast, and I read it and, and I recommend it for anybody who truly wants to study the end times and what the book of Revelation means when it talks about the beast. You show throughout history and throughout the Bible 
a, a number of different personas that, that, that really give foreshadows of what the Antichrist is going to be like. Can you give us a, a, a few words about the book right now? Well, absolutely. To begin with the 666 number of the beast has led to much speculation. There are certain things that are indicators of who the ultimate Antichrist will be, but there were many Antichrists and many false prophets. All of the Antichrists and false prophets that have occurred in biblical history and in church history are shadows of these final two beasts. We have to understand the shadows to understand the substance. It's like the Epistle of Hebrews tells us, the Levitical sacrificial system was the shadow so that the Hebrews would be able to recognize the Messiah when he came. They knew the shadow, so when the substance came, they knew who he was. Well, it's the same thing. The shadows teach about the one who has the substance. All of the other antichrists and false prophets highlight some aspect of the two final ones. Taking again 666, the number of the beast. People have conjectured all kinds of things. The papal title, um, the, the name of Henry Kissinger and Norman Numbles, so all kinds of things, but much of it's speculative. And there's a place for the grammatical study of a name, for sure, as stuff within the book. However, the first question we need to ask is, where else does 666 occur in scripture? Well, twice it occurs with Baxter and Solomon. And in fact, four times, technically, it occurs with Baxter and Solomon. If you look at the architecture of his throne, it occurs with the dimensions of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. It occurs in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. The sons of Adonai come. Before we look elsewhere, where else is that number in Scripture? Well, when you begin to see where else that number is in Scripture, you understand the nature of the deception the Antichrist is going to perpetrate and how he is going to do it. Let him who has wisdom count the number of the beast. This is one of the reasons we know that we have to take 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 literally. The rapture, the hard case of, the episunagage will not happen until we know who he is. But he who has wisdom. Oh, that's the tribulation saints. If they had wisdom, they wouldn't be here either. They would have been raptured as well. That doesn't even make sense. Would Jesus have warned repeatedly about the Antichrist if we didn't have to worry about who he even was? It's not even logical what these people are saying. There are many Antichrists. They've always been around, but in the last days, their numbers multiply as anything else. We have to understand this deception is coming. The stage is being set for the Antichrist and false prophet as we speak. Now is the time to acquire the wisdom to identify him. Do not believe people who are telling you, don't worry about that. They may be our brethren in Christ, they may be sincere, but they are sincerely misled. Don't let them mislead you. We must know who these two sinister, nefarious figures are. And, and, and Jacob, um, a lot of uh, folks who are interested in, in end times prophecy and eschatology, they focus on the Church of Babylon, or they focus on the Antichrist, but there's not a lot of focus on the false prophet. Can you just explain the difference in the false prophet and the false church um, for our viewers? Sure. The last thing it says in the Old Testament before Jesus came was Elijah was going to come to prepare the way for the Messiah. We know that this was fulfilled on the one who was called Yohanan HaMakbir, John the Baptist. He was the harbinger of the first coming of the Messiah. But Jesus said, Elijah will come. He's going to come again. In some way, Elijah comes again. The Antichrist counterfeits Christ. The false prophet will be the counterfeit Elijah, the counterfeit John the Baptist. Now, this is an intriguing and an in depth subject. I couldn't explain it in two minutes or five minutes. Read the book, not that I'm trying to make a sale, but it's in the book. But he will be a count, the counterfeit of Elijah, the counterfeit of John the Baptist. And, 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 and so, working with the false church, yes, the false Babylon, they will promote the Antichrist, who, who then. Well, they will promote an interfaith unity with the political agenda that will in turn give platform to the Antichrist. Terrific, terrific. So, so on to your third book then. 
Park Hexel, yes. Park Hexel. In, in, in this time, uh, you know, very dangerous time, tribulation time, which which um, I, I think you can guess by now that um, Jacob is, is presenting a side of the rapture and the side of the tribulation period where we very well as the church could be living through much of it or part of it. Um, Jacob, can you can you give us some thoughts on your book, Har Harpezo, and what you're trying to say to our audience? In the book, Harpezo, again, it is proactive. We're not reacting against anything or any other position. It does not set out to say, here is how pre-tribulationism is wrong, or here how pre rat is misguided, or here how post-trib is wrong. It doesn't do that. It simply says, this is what the Word of God says about the rapture. This is how the early church understood it. Daniel says it will be a progressive revelation. Therefore, the curtain will go up. That's what apocalypse means. As we speak, the curtain is going up. Our point of commencement must be how the early church understood these things, the people who got their doctrine directly from the Messiah. Now, we use the term eschatology. It is in a sense, a misnomer in its, in its popular usage as a, as a Christian colloquialism. Eschaton, eschato in Greek, actually means latter. In Hebrews chapter 1, we are already in the latter days. We are already in the last days. It's the age of the church. We have to distinguish between latter days and what Jesus called the end of the age. The end of the age is not the same as the latter days. We're already in the latter days. Now, unfortunately, the preterists know this and have played this card very heavily to try to say there's no future meaning to the book of Revelation and so forth. It was all fulfilled in 70 AD, which is, of course, false. Nonetheless, we have to be careful of the term eschatology. It's, it's a misnomer as it's, as it's popularly used based on the etymology and the definition of the original Greek word. Okay. There are two, there are two misconceptions that have come into play, and there is one notoriously dangerous presupposition. I'll deal with the two misconceptions. The first misconception is that the idea of imminency Jesus can come at any time. Therefore, it must be pre-tribulationism. We have to live as if he can come tonight. We have to live holy and moral lives as if Jesus can come any time. If you get rid of imminency, in terms of your eschatology, for want of a better term, you're, you're going to create a disincentive for people to live morally consecrated lives and things like that. Because they'll just wait until they see the Antichrist. That's right. There's an agreement with Israel. This, this is... Uh, Pure folly. Let me explain why. In the parable of the bonds, Jesus made it clear, tonight your soul is required of you, you foolish man. Imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. Jesus can come at any time for any one of us. Can Jesus come five minutes from now? Yes, for me or for you. Can he come tonight? Yes, for me or for you. We need to live morally consecrated lives anyway because he can come at any time for any of us. It does not depend on the timing of the rapture. Imminency in no sense depends on the timing of the rapture. People invented that concept. It's not a New Testament concept. So he can still come as a thief in the night. Of course he can, even if it's at the very individually. Individually. individually he can. Now, of course, it has, it has a meaning prophetically for, for the rapture. The night being a picture of the tribulation at the end. He's coming like a thief in the night, watchman, watchman, how far is the night? The bridegroom comes in the night for the bride. Night is a figure of, of the end of the age, what happens? The spiritual darkness that overtakes the world and so forth. But he, he can come any time for any of us. The second misconception they have is this. The blessed hope. Oh, if you don't believe in pre-tribulationism, you don't have the blessed hope. Well, did Paul have the blessed hope? Yes. Did the rapture happen during his lifetime? No. But he still had the blessed hope. The blessed hope is the parousia. It's the return of Christ. 
whether it be by anesthesia, a resurrection, or by harpazo rapture. He's coming. The Episunagage are gathering together to him. The parousia is returned, the revelation of him. It doesn't matter if we are alive in Christ or asleep in bed. If we go to be with the Lord, it doesn't matter. The blessed hope is there whether you're dead or alive. It doesn't matter. The blessed hope has nothing whatsoever to do with whether we are alive when the Lord comes or if we've gone to sleep in the Lord to be with him. It does not matter. Those are the two misconceptions. The third problem is this ridiculous presupposition. With absolutely no linguistic or theological license, none, no basis whatsoever, pre-tribulational people have made the Greek word delipsis, tribulation or affliction, and the Greek word orge, wrath, synonyms. And effectively, they've added a third word, that is most detestable. They are not synonyms, they're different words in Greek and they mean different things. No, we are not appointed to wrath. Believers will never experience the wrath of God, but Jesus said you will have tribulation in the world. They've given themselves some kind of theological license to make words synonymous, which are not. It's a nonsense. It's a complete nonsense. It is totally contrived. The early church did not believe in pre-tribulationism. It was largely the innovation of John Nelson Darby and those who influenced him and those who followed him, but it was not a scriptural concept and was not held to the apostolic church. So Jacob, from, from what I understand what you're saying is, is that we as the church or, or the body of Christ may go through a significant portion of the entire seven year tribulation. Not the entire seven year, the rapture occurs between the sixth and seventh seals. Okay. Here the pre-wrath people are the closest to the truth. They're not completely right because they have a number of things wrong concerning the identity of the restrainer. That's why our position is intraseal. We don't call it pre-wrath. The pre-wrath people are right that it's between the sixth and seventh seal. They are right in saying we must know who the Antichrist is before it will happen, but they have a lot of other errors associated with their belief system. They say that the restrainer is an angel instead of the Holy Spirit. There's other errors and they, they misunderstand things about the nature of the two witnesses and so forth. But one right. of the major positions, the pre-wrath are, to some degree, the closest to the truth. And your book, Harpazzo, really lays that yes, out. Yes, absolutely. Out but not, not polemically, not as a way of challenging these other positions, just looking proactively at what the scriptures say. Okay. Jacob, a couple more questions yeah. um, along this line. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I may have got the, the yeah, scripture okay. wrong. I'm sorry. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith yes. on the earth? So can, can you explain how that relates to the tribulation period? Will there be an organized church? There will be believers, but the church will not exist the way it has since the day of Pentecost. Right. There will be the shattering of the power of the holy people. We have to understand something. When Jesus rose from the dead, he breathed on the disciples, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. A regeneration took place. The Holy Spirit was in them. I will never leave you or forsake you. That's the Holy Spirit in dwelling. But then he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. On the Feast of Weeks, Hag Shavuot, what Christians call the Day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit will never be taken from the heart of believers. But it will be taken from the world. He will no longer convict the world of sin. The church will not be united and empowered in the way it has since the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit will only be in the hearts of God's people individually, as it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, only certain people have the Holy Spirit. High priests, kings, prophets, judges, patriarchs, and certain individuals. It'll be like that. It'll be for his people alone. The church will no longer be empowered to bring a message of grace and salvation to the world. It will be the night. It will be the shattering of the power of the holy people. God reverts back to dealing with Israel and the Jews and behaving the way he did in the old covenant with Israel and the Jews. He becomes the God of wrath and of anger. 
The church is removed, the faithful church is removed from this period before the wrath of God is poured out. The faithful believers will never experience the wrath of God, but they will enter this seven year period. Another presupposition is the tribulation or the great tribulation is the full seven year period. No, it isn't. The scripture never teaches that. There's the beginning of sorrows, there's the tribulation, the great tribulation, and then there's the wrath, also known as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord commences when the faithful church is removed and God pours out his judgment on the kingdom of Antichrist. The faithful church is not here for that. But it's certainly here yeah. for the first six seals. The rapture occurs between the sixth and seventh seal. Again, I point you to the book. Yes. Look, many godly people who I love and respect and who are generally right about most things believe in the myth, the fantasy of pre-tribulationism. But it is a myth and a fantasy invented by somebody who was a despot. Charles Spurgeon warned that John Darby was a despot and a religious nut. George Mueller warned that Darby was a despot and a religious nut. They put ads in the newspapers warning about him. Many of the early Plymouth brethren who knew Darby, Dr. Samuel Tregalus, Greek scholar, much more learned than Darby was. Uh, James Grant, certainly uh, uh, Benjamin Newton. These are themselves dispensationalists who were in the brethren movement who knew Darby. They say he was a cult leader. The cult still exists. The closed brethren are a cult. They destroy families and marriages in Great Britain. They still exist. Barbie was a cult leader. Not only that, he was a confused man. There is nothing more anti-dispensational than infant baptism. It's completely anti-dispensational to, to, to sprinkle an infant and call that baptism. But Darby did it. Darby believed in infant baptism. But then he went into hyper-dispensationalism, what later became known as, as, a, as Bullingerism, refuted in this country by the late, great Harry Ironside. Darby taught that the epistle of James is part of the Old Testament, it's not for the church. Darby taught that the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, it's only for Old Testament Israel. It was a sanitized form of the ancient heresy of Marcionism. He was a confused man. He had beliefs that were seriously erroneous. He was personally an autocratic despot, and he was a cult leader. His movement began at a time when other cults began in the 19th century, in the aftermath of the Millerites, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists. They all came from the same period. Well, Darby's movement was one of them. Now, we can say a lot more about Darby, but he was at best a confused man. He was despotic, and he was somebody who had seriously, seriously false views. He is the inventor, the primary architect of pre-tribulationism was a cult leader. I challenge anybody to debate me publicly. That includes Thomas Ice. I will debate you publicly about the beliefs of John Darwin. And, and Jacob, for the last question, I would like to ask you how, how can we as your listeners and we as followers of Christ be ready for the rapture how can we make sure that when it does occur whenever it does occur that we are, are taken up with the believing remnant of Christ if you want to know what kind of Christians are going to be ready for the second coming of Christ look at what kind of Jews were ready for his first coming when you read the infancy narratives of the gospel and you see what kind of Jews be it the old lady Anna or the old man Simeon, be it the teenager Miriam and her fiance Joseph, or be it Elisheva and Zachariah, parents of John the Baptist. Look at the kinds of Jews who are ready for his first coming. That is the kind of Christians who are going to be ready for his second coming. God bless you. Thank you very much. Brother Jacob, we have a, a couple more questions. Some people would argue that if you're truly a Christian, you can't fall away because God has sealed you. He'll never leave or forsake you. He, you know, these are arguments that, that, that you hear theologically in the Christian world 
and, and even it, it goes down to the concept of election. Can you can you explain? Is it possible for a Christian to fall away? If it were not possible, Jesus would not have said it is. Many will fall away and betray one another. Many more. They will apostatize. If it were not possible, he wouldn't have said it is. Um, there will be a great falling away in the last days. It's already happened. We've seen an avalanche of entire denominations and movements falling away. I live in Great Britain. The five biggest Protestant churches, the five biggest, the Church of England, called Episcopalianism in the USA, Anglicanism. Church of Scotland, its sister church, the Presbyterian Church, United Reformed Church of the Methodists. All five are ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. All five. We've seen the apostasy of whole churches, whole denominations. Many are falling away and betraying one another. We see people professing to be evangelicals today, endorsing same-sex marriage and speaking critically, not of same-sex marriage, but of the Bible-believing Christians who say that the Word of God says it's wrong. It's happening, and it's going to get worse before Jesus comes. I believe we are eternally secure in Christ. If you remain in Christ, you are eternally secure. But it is not unconditional. No, he will never leave us or forsake us. But that does not say people cannot leave him. One of the distortions of scripture that these people engage in is, comes from John 10. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. That is talking exegetically about the kleptos, about the thief. It's not talking about the probaton, the sheep. They're taking something that applies to the kleptos, to the thief, and they misapply it to the sheep. Sheep tend to wander. Now this is a massive subject, goes beyond the scope of what we have time for today. But we have a recording available on our website. Uh, it's called Electos. I'd suggest if you're interested in the subject that you read it. We have to understand where this came from. Calvin largely invented this in reaction to the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Now you're saved, now you're not. In order to finance the construction projects of the Renaissance, like the Vatican, indulgences were sold by the Dominicans. Now you're saved, now you're not, now you're saved, now you're not. In reaction to that error, another error was invented. Going back to the time of the church fathers, unfortunately, too much of the church has been very good at refuting error with other error. We don't refute error with error. We refute error with truth. Now, do I believe in eternal security? As the Bible teaches it, yes, but not as Calvinism has redefined it. They come up with this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints as one example. That's from Calvin's, well, it wasn't even Calvin's tulip. The tulip was invented by Beza and the Hermanns of Dort. Calvin himself never even taught it. Calvin was not a Calvinist. But that's their problem. Let's look at the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 12. What does it say? Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. That's the only place the term perseverance of the saints occurs in Scripture in the Greek or in an English translation. It has absolutely nothing in its context to do with Calvinism. It's a prophecy about believers at a certain future time in history. It has nothing to do with unconditional one saved, all we saved. They take the verse out of the context of the passage and give it an entirely different meaning of their own invention. That's not what perseverance of the saints means. Now, while I don't believe in perseverance of the saints, I do believe in the perseverance of the Lord. I do believe the Good Shepherd leads the 99 for the one. Let's look at one passage that explains this very clearly, 1 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> you had an ugly case of gross immorality involving incestuous relationship. Something so debaucherous, again, diabolical, that Paul said the pagans wouldn't do it. 
Paul says, I purposed to give this one over to Satan. It's just a real meaning of body and loosing, little one there, that his soul may be saved. God bought a destructive judgment. Let Satan destroy the biological life of that backslider to get him to repent rather than see him be eternally lost. God will put a backslider on their deathbed rather than see them die unrepentant. But the theoretical danger of them dying unrepentant is obviously there. Paul would not have had to give him over to Satan to destroy his flesh if there was no danger of him falling away. Oh, he was never saved to begin with. Yes, he was. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, they become partakers of the Holy Spirit. I actually heard some silly man tell me, oh, well, that just meant they, they, they licked it or they chewed on it. They didn't swallow it. You cannot be a partaker of the Holy Spirit unless you are born again. Read Hebrews 6. Read Hebrews 10. This erroneous teaching is not true. The beliefs of John Wesley and Jacob Arminius were much closer to the truth. Calvinism has done tremendous harm spiritually, theologically, and sociologically to the church. You know them by their fruits. It's an indictment of itself. The Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa, apartheid, ultra-Calvinist. The Southern Baptists of America, slavery, were the elect, ultra-Calvinist. The Presbyterians of Northern Ireland, the plantation period, what they did to the Catholics. John Wesley said, no wonder Catholics don't want to get saved. If this is the way you treat them, yeah, but we're the elect. That all came from Calvinists. Right from the beginning, look at his police state, his Taliban police state in Geneva. He was a tyrant. They burned people alive in the name of Christ. Their own history is an ugly indictment of it. Calvinism is based on humanism. Calvin was a humanist. It's not clear if Calvin was ever even saved. He never professed to have had a conversion experience. And anything he wrote, he wrote naturally. I don't say he wasn't, but you can't prove that anything he ever wrote or testified to that he was. You can prove he killed people. But you can't prove Ben was born again by any testimony of his own. I don't know if he was or he wasn't, but I do know what he did in Geneva. I do know what the Puritans did in Massachusetts and Salem. I do know what they did on the Cromwell in England, torturing old ladies, drowning them, burning them, accusing people of being witches with no real evidence, with spectral evidence. God showed me Mary Jones is a witch. They burned and hung people. They killed old ladies. This is what they did. Read their own history. Calvinism is evil. I don't say Calvinists are evil, but Calvinism is evil. You know them by their fruits, its own history indicts it. So Jacob, when, when Paul told Timothy, guard your doctrine, for in doing so you'll save both yourself and your hearers, yeah. is that part of... of Obviously, you must continue in Christ. Look, here's the way it works. This is the example I often give. We're here in the United States. I live in England mostly. If somebody was swimming from the White Cliffs of Dover to France, or from swimming from France, from Normandy and France, to the White Cliffs of Dover, yes. Pretty good swimmer, they can maybe make it swimming in English Channel. But a gale force comes and a storm comes, and it's raining and thunder, and the waves become tumultuous, and they're going up there. They go into muscular fatigue, they begin swallowing salt water. Now they're going to hypothermia, they're dead. Can't make it to the White Cliffs of Dover, they can't even see the White Cliffs of Dover. They're disoriented. They say, God help me, God help me, oh Jesus save me. A helicopter comes down out of the clouds and says Jesus on it, and a Jewish guy with a beard sticks his head out and says, you called me and you want me to save you. Yes, Jesus, please save me. I can save you, but you have to trust me. You understand? You're doomed. You're finished. You're dead. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You have to trust me to save you. 
You understand that? You can do nothing. You're as good as dead. I have to do something for you. You can't do for yourself. You got that? Yes, Jesus. All right, put this on. And he throws him a life jacket. This is what Isaiah says. He is the shiny big day Yeshua. He is the kaya atani. He clothed me with the garments of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. Put this on. Okay, Jesus, I got it on. What do I do now? Keep swimming. The Lord did something for him. He couldn't do for himself or herself. They were doomed. He saved them. The scriptures do not say work for your salvation in fear and trembling. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You have to act on it. You take that life jacket off, I hope you're a real good swimmer. But I guarantee you're not going to make it. The little boy wanted to buy his, 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 his hobby was building model airplanes and model ships. And there was a, a model of an American aircraft carrier, and he really wanted it. But it was a lot of money. The kid didn't make enough money on his paper route to buy this big model of, of the Nimitz, hypothetically. So for his birthday, his father bought him the model. The kid was so happy. He took the model, looked at the picture, opened the box. It was a gift. He didn't earn it. But he had to read the instructions. He had to get the glue. He had to get the magnifying glass and the tweezers. And he had to. Yeah. Didn't work for it, but he had to work it out. Yeah. Yeah. That is the way salvation works. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Jacob, I think we see a theme throughout all of your books and throughout what you're saying is that the cure, the remedy, uh, for to keep us to safeguard us from falling away is not to listen to the to, to men's commentaries on the scripture, but but to go right to the scripture itself, right to the, the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. And, and, and never go to any book, including the ones I've written. Never go to any book, including the ones I've written, until you've gone to the Lord about this book. First, see what the Holy Spirit shows you. Then look to other sources. And, and just, just can you elaborate for us? Because there, there's a term that that's been used often, and it's becoming, uh, you know, well known in, in many communities, and, in, and especially the Calvinist community. And that's the term of monergism, where uh, God Himself has to do everything to uh, to save us, in, including, um, you know, once we're saved, He saves us. He does all the work. And after we're saved, he does all the work. Um, Again, a false doctrine. Work out your salvation. Not work for it. Work it out. And so, 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 so we do have a part to play. Absolutely. Not in earning it. Right. But in acting upon it. What would you say uh, the danger? Uh, there's... there's in the Christian music world, which which seems seems to be more and more ubiquitous, the Christian singers are, are very popular and, and have a lot of uh, um, you know, star appeal in the Christian community. And yet, there's songs that are on the radio that are clearly unbiblical, but but they're also very popular. I'll give you an example of a song that just just came on the radio recently. It says, "I belong to you, Lord, far from the things I do." Far from the things I do, far from the things I belong to you no matter what. What well, is there a danger in the the Christian music ministry in leading people? Well, that's particular there because I have truth. But let's talk about is there a danger? Yeah. Again, in the modern worldview, because of computer communication, people speak in slang. They speak in uh, sound bites. They don't. They no longer speak in comprehensive sentences or paragraphs. Okay, it all becomes colloquialisms. Much of it fermented by social media. Okay, this began with the poison of the video movement. People were acquiring their doctrine not from the exposition of scripture. This is why one of the reasons Chuck Smith. Came the late John Luke out of Calvary Chapels. They were not acquiring their doctrine. 
from the exposition of scripture, but by singing choruses. Someone once said, there's no doxology without theology. Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the lyrics are not scriptural, they're not of God. But look what's happening. It's again what I heard David Hockey call the 7-Eleven choruses. The same seven words repeated 11 times. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't repeat the phrases. It's like empty. It's a mantra. It comes from Hinduism. It is not spirituality. It is mysticism. And so much of what they're singing is not scriptural. So much of the lyrics of Hillsong, which is now buried in financial and sexual scandal publicly, is not scriptural. The river song, that nonsense that came out of Pensacola, went the pooling, the lyrics are not even biblical. But people just keep singing it and repeating it, and that becomes their doctrine. Except it's false doctrine. Or it's a doctrine that has no substance. But that's where people are getting their doctrine. I mindlessly singing choruses when those words are not even scriptural. Again, something else I always highlight, I apologize to those who heard me say it. Our faith is Christocentric, not pneumocentric. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus, not himself. The Holy Spirit is worshipped as God in the context of the triunity of the Godhead. Charles Wesley, holy, 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 God in three persons, perfectly biblical. But not one place, not one time in Scripture do you see the Holy Spirit addressed in prayer outside of the triunity of the Godhead. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Good morning, Holy Spirit! Garbage! Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall! Garbage! It is not scriptural. Another spirit gets in and counterfeits it. The fruit of the spirit is a crete, self-control. That's why you see people out of control. And the nonsense with Rodney Howard Brown and Toronto and Pensacola and these other idiotic abominations pretending to be Pentecost. And I say that as somebody who believes in the gifts of the spirit. But those are not gifts of the spirit. That stuff is lunacy. Some of it is demonic. Our faith is not pneumocentric. It is Christocentric. That's just one example. What used to be Christian music ministry is now the Christian music industry based in Nashville, Tennessee, with pop charts, with groupies, with everything that's taking the world as virtually. It's just a business. The same has happened to Christian publishing. The same has happened to Christian music publishing. It's happened to the Christian recording ministry. Now it's just the Christian recording industry. It's whatever sells. The Christian books, book companies, the publishing houses, are generally owned by secular conglomerates. They'll publish whatever sells. Whether it's doctrinally true or false, doesn't matter. It sells. Well, they'll do the same with the music. If it sells, they'll market it. That's all it is, is a business and a racket. Do you think that, that in, in the book of Daniel, uh, when, when the men were forced to bow before the statue of the beast? Absolutely. Do you think that absolutely? Uh, yeah. The question is, can can this potentially, you know, we it's setting the stage for it? Setting the stage. For yes, for absolutely. Coming at the Antichrist and, and bowing down. Okay. People, be, there's a Greek word mesmero. They become mesmerized. They become you become predisposed to spiritual deception by mysticism and emotional manipulation. This happens because of sensuality. Music can be highly, highly sensual. Now, sensuality is not wrong if it is controlled intellectually and spiritually. For instance, you can have a romantic relationship with your wife, but if you marry her in Christ, it's controlled, it's in God's order. But if somebody is just going around fornicating or committing adultery, they may be doing the same stuff. But it's only sensuality. It's just putting the senses as, as the apex. Instead of supporting it, supporting the senses to the, the higher aspects of the human person and spirit um, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This is what's happening. And what's really tragic is this sensuality has gone out of control beyond the music. 
Just look at Hillsong. Contemporary Christian music. Just look at Hillsong. Frank Houston, homosexual pedophile, the patriarch of Hillsong. It's been known for years. Now his son is under police investigation, Brian Houston, for protecting his pedophile father at the expense of not protecting the children. Pat Masini, at least he liked girls. He was number two in Hillsong. Most sick, Bobby Houston, his wife, her series, Christian Women Love Sex. That is sick. If you look at the Song of Solomon, what the scripture says about marital love, the focus is on the relationship and on the person. Sexuality is simply the vehicle to express the love, but the focus is on loving the person. Christian women love the Lord, they love their husbands. Christian women love babies. How do I get one? Get that scriptural. Hillsong? Christian women love sex. They take it off the person and put it on the act. The same as the world. The same as Hollywood. The same as the pornography industry. That vulgar mouth who was caught in plagiarism, Mark Driscoll, and the same thing, the vulgar trashy mouth. Now I have no problem addressing sexual issues scripturally. But why the vulgarity? And they're not focusing on a Christian perspective of what romance is supposed to be. In fact, it's not even about romance. Christian women love sex. Oh. 13, 14 year old girls were into this in Hillsong. This is Hillsong. No wonder they're under investigation criminally. It comes from the music. The sensuality predisposed itself. I have seen video clips. Bill has seen. Bill Randall has seen them. What was going on in Toronto? Some of that stuff was out and out promiscuous. Women on the floor behaving in a way that was beyond description. And this was in a church. This is unbelievable. It used to be. It, 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 and now, now it's even gone beyond that. You've got people like Steve Chalk and Tony Campolo calling for the church to modify its position on homosexuality. As I pointed out, 30 years ago, Christian youth ministers used to say to Christian parents, Talk to your teenagers about sex before the world does. 30 years ago, Christian pastors and youth ministers told Christian parents, talk to your kids about sex before the world does. They were right 30 years ago. Now, talk to your kids about sex before the backslidden church does. Talk to your kids about sex before the Houston's do. Talk to your kids about sex before Hillsong does. Talk to your kids about sex before Mark Crystal does. Talk to your kids about sex before Steve Chalk does. Protect your kids from the backsliding church if you love them. That's what's happening. And it's inextricably linked very often, particularly in the song, to the music. Yeah. And it's all setting the stage for the, <laughs> and, and for the rise of the false church. And Jacob, can, can you elaborate once again? How, how can we prepare ourselves, prepare our church, be ready individually for the coming of the Lord. You know, we have a recording on our website. Christmas is coming. Yeah. It's not about Christmas, it's about the nativity. I keep coming back to this. Look at what kind of Jews were ready for his first coming. The faithful remnant of Jews who were ready for his first coming are a very, very accurate picture of what kind of Christians are going to be ready for his return. Amen. Look at Amman. What does it say about her? What does it say about Simeon? Or the shepherds? <coughs> what does it say about the parents of John the Baptist? You want to know what kind of Christians are going to be ready for him to come? Look at what kind of Jews are ready for him to come. And if you want to know what kind of Christians are not going to be ready for him to come, Look at what kind of Jews were not ready for him to come. It's going to be the same thing again. Christmas is coming. It's the recording. You can get it. And Jacob, where can we find your books again? Again, Amazon, certain Christian bookshops, at least the ones that like me, there's not too many of those. <laughs> um, but the Moriel website, M-O-R-I-E-L.org, we'd love to hear from you.